had a very splendid weekend. Yeah. Has it been awesome? And I believe the next year there will be a solar sphere on a slightly different date to coincide with uh, a moon, I believe. So what's the uh, usual spaces? Uh, before I introduce our final speaker of the weekend, can we have a massive round of applause and cheer for the organisers of Solar Sphere? Peter, Sarah, Sybil. Well done. We look forward to next year, yeah? So yes, our final speaker this evening, this afternoon, you all know her very well, and uh, her chosen subject for today is feedback. booming, is feedback. How to control feedback. <laughs> At the edge, how leaving our solar system can tell us more about the sun. Will you please put your hands together for Dr. Lucy Green. <laughs> until the end and then um, have people forget what you wanted to say. So with the talk, I want to have a look at the solar system, both what's at the edge, but what's at the centre as well, because of course that's the sun. But I should also apologise that I'm slightly jet-lagged at the moment. I just flew in from the International Astronomical Union's conference, where we had two and, a half, two and a half thousand astronomers meeting to talk about their latest science. So my body clock is 11, year, 11 hours. Sorry, that's <laughs> <laughs> 11 hours behind, but um, don't feel too sorry for me because I was in Hawaii, so it wasn't really that bad. <laughs> so, my talk this afternoon starts um, with the planets and with a look at probably the most famous missions we've had. Do any missions, space missions, come to mind when you see this? You might even recognise what's Voyager. Before. Voyager, hey, excellent. <laughs> So you're right, these are the Voyager missions that were launched in uh, 1977 by NASA to take advantage of the alignment of the outer planets. So NASA knew if they launched planet, uh, see here we go, <laughs> my brain is scrambled, launched their spacecraft in 1977, they could sort of hop on from one planet to the next, going through Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And it was a special al alignment that only happens once every 175 years. And it means that you can visit all the planets with minimal amounts of fuel, so it makes the mission a lot cheaper. So they were launched in 1977. Um, we had closest approaches happening in the late uh, 70s and then into the 1980s, with Voyager 1 going to um, Jupiter and Saturn, and then Voyager 2 going to those two planets, but then also going on to encounter Uranus and Neptune as well. And they took spectacular images, we still use them today, they made all kinds of discoveries. But NASA decided that these spacecraft <laughs> weren't finished yet. They still had fuel, they still had funding, and they still had an awful lot of science that could be done. So, in 1989, after an incredible journey past these planets, NASA started a new phase for the Voyager spacecraft something that they called the Interstellar Mission. And really, that's sort of the, the focus of my talk, because these spacecraft were tasked with finding out where the edge of the solar system is. And that's what I want to have a look at. What happened? What did they find? And also, why do we even think about the solar system having an edge? And, and where might that edge be? So, because I'm a solar scientist, I'm not really interested in the planets after all, that was just to set the scene. I want to know about the sun, and I use the definition for where the edge is to mean where the sun actually ends. So this is our typical way of looking at the sun, for me anyway, as a space scientist, I'm sure you've had some good views. Have you had good views of the sun this weekend? Is it correct? Yeah. yeah, brilliant. So you've been looking using visible light, and you've probably seen some sunspots, but not much 
much else. But if you go above the Earth's atmosphere and you use wavelengths other than visible light, you can see the sun like this. So this is a picture of the sun in ultraviolet light. And it was a great success of the space age when we realized that the sun emits light in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum and in, in X-rays. So we can't see this from the ground because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs those wavelengths. And it was speculated for quite some time that the sun might have a hot atmosphere that glowed in X-rays and ultraviolet, but it was only when we got spacecraft above the Earth's atmosphere in the 1950s um, uh, and 60s that we could see that directly um, and answered answer a controversial question for us. So we can see the sun like this. Um, the brighter regions on the surface sit above sunspots, so the kind of features that you would have seen in the visible light telescopes. But there was another mission launched um, later on by the European Space Agency called Ulysses, which gave us an opportunity to start to investigate where this hot atmosphere of the sun ends and what this atmosphere is like. Has anybody heard of the Ulysses mission? It's not working anymore. Yeah, a couple of nodding heads. So this was a mission that went into orbit around the sun. It didn't have any cameras on board, so it wasn't interested in looking at the beautiful sun. It just wanted to measure what the space around the sun was like. And it looked out for the presence of magnetic fields, which is important to this story. Everything you see in this picture is shaped by magnetic fields. But it was also on the lookout for electrically charged particles or plasma, which is also relevant to the sun because everything you're seeing is light coming from that plasma. So Ulysses was looking to sort of sniff and sense and taste around the spacecraft what makes up the sun, magnetic fields and electrically charged gas. And it found some interesting things. So what I want to show you now are two plots that show what it found in terms of um, whether there is a plasma or an electrically charged gas around the sun, what that gas is doing, and whether there's a magnetic field at these vast distances from the sun. So this is the first plot. So, okay, um, so I like to show plots. I hope you like to see plots. <laughs> so what I've got here is a picture of the sun in the centre, and then there are two axes on there. Um, one going uh, across well, both of them actually going across the middle and then going vertically shows a velocity, a speed, and that's the speed that this gas is moving at that this spacecraft is detecting. And you can see that the speed varies around the sun. So actually the sort of take-home message in this plot is this um, the sort of circular jaggedy line around the sun shows the speed that the gas was moving at. And you probably can't read it off the scale very easily. But those speeds go up to around 800 kilometers a second. So that's how fast this gas was moving. That's ionized hydrogen. Yeah, that's right. Ionized hydrogen, um, mostly ionized hydrogen, about 75%. Then some uh, helium, ionized helium, about 20, 25%-ish. And then a tiny, tiny um, uh, percentage that's other elements like carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, iron. Yeah, mostly hydrogen though. So when you rip that apart, you get electrons and protons. And this plot is really significant because it shows us that the sun has wind. So it shows us that this gas around the sun is actually flowing out into space at hundreds of kilometers a second, which is a phenomenal thought. And we call it the solar wind, we're not very creative when we name the things that are associated with the sun. Um, but you can see that sort of at the top and the bottom, above the poles of the sun, the speed is quite high. But then around its middle, around its equator, the speed is much lower. So maybe around, I don't know, um, four or 500 kilometers a second. So the sun has wind, but it's a sort of variable wind. And it's quite gusty as well, it can blow fast, it can blow slow. And this is the um, feature of the sun that produces comet's tails. So for all those jets that you've seen coming out of um, Comet Churyumov Grazimenko at the moment, 67P, they're, jet, they're being um, forced back into the solar system by this wind coming out from the sun. So Ulysses did this really nice lap of the sun. It went round once and it measured the speed of the solar wind. And it also measured the magnetic field. And what's also being shown on this plot is that magnetic field. So you'll notice at the top of the sun, that trace is coloured in red, and at the bottom it's coloured in blue. 
And that's to indicate that the sun is a bit like a bar magnet, with a magnetic field coming out of the top of the sun, wrapping around and then coming back in the bottom again. So it's got direction. It's got a north magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole. But Ulysses wasn't done after one orbit, which took um, several years. So they decided, right, we've got funding, we're going to keep it going round again. So it went round again, and then on its <coughs> next lap, lap, this is what it saw in terms of the solar wind. So completely different. Now there's not the sort of nice, organised, fast streams at the top and slow streams around the middle. Now all these fast and slow streams are all intermixed. And the reason for that is because the sun has changed during these years from what we call cycle minimum to cycle maximum. So when you looked on the sun, well actually we're just after solar maximum at the moment, but there may not have been very many sunspots because we're having a sort of mini maximum at the moment. But on the left hand side, that solar wind was created when there were very few sunspots. And on the right hand side, that's the wind that's created when there's lots and lots and lots of sunspots. And so I think Ulysses really nicely painted a picture that our hot star with its million degree atmosphere is expanding into the cold vacuum of the solar system and the atmosphere is expanding at an incredibly fast rate and it carves out this sort of bubble around the solar system that we call the heliosphere and so for me the edge of the solar system and the edge that the Voyager spacecraft were looking for is where this solar wind stops where does it blow out does it stop just after the Earth? Does it stop around the outer planets? Or does it go out even further than that? And um, I put this little animation in to sort of try and illustrate what it might look like if you were looking at the heliosphere from the outside. So this shows a sort of cartoon of our galaxy with its spiral arms, and then it zooms in to have a look at where the um, solar system is, about two thirds of the way out towards the edge of, of the galaxy of the Milky Way. And this bubble, it's sort of how we conceptualise the bubble that's created by the solar wind, by this outflowing gas and this outflowing magnetic field. And then, because the solar system is moving through space, you sort of get the feeling that it might be a bit like a windsock, sort of compressed on one side as it moves into the dust left by um, previously um, exploded stars, and they're sort of maybe drawn out on the far side. So that, to me, is what the heliosphere probably looks like. But to really know that, we've got to get to the edge. And that's why the Voyager spacecraft was so important, because we had theories, we had ideas. But if we can actually put spacecraft at that boundary of where the solar wind ends, then, then we can really know and answer the question, does it look something like that? So I want to show you now one of my favorite movies of the sun which I think really drives home the fact that the sun is expanding and it has a solar wind. Now, it's quite a special movie because it's been taken by two spacecraft that are in orbit around the sun. They were launched by NASA in 2006 and the mission is called Stereo. So the idea was that you would have these two eyes looking at the sun and you'd get a stereo vision like we have two eyes and it would give you a sense of depth and perspective on the sun's atmosphere. But they went into orbit around the sun, and one went ahead of the Earth in our orbit, and one lagged behind. So actually, you get this really nice, different perspective. And one spacecraft can look back at the sun and the Earth from one direction, and the other one is looking from the other side, looking at the sun and the Earth. And in fact, they've been in orbit around the sun so long now that they've um, just crossed on the far side, and they're heading back around towards us again. One of them we've lost contact with, but we're hoping that in maybe October this year, when it sort of comes around a bit further towards us, we might be able to get back in contact with it. So these movies were, uh, were made before that happened. So I'll show you um, the setup. So what I hope you can see is in the middle, that tiny orange dot is the sun. Then I've got different cameras that are taking images, and you can see uh, going out into the red, gives you sort of a field of view, far away from the sun and then going into the blue again shows you really, really far away from the sun. And if you've got really, really good eyes, you'll see that the dots on the far left and the far right have got the word Earth written by it. So in fact, these spacecraft 
show us all the way from the sun to the earth from those two different perspectives. So on the left hand side you've got the view from one spacecraft and on the right hand side you've got the view from the other. And I find that incredible. So this is the first time that we've seen the space between the sun and the earth. And you can see all the stars in the background, but if I run the movie, then you'll be able to see what the solar wind looks like. So hopefully, even in this bright room, you can see a constant outflow of material. And it's really, really tenuous. You know, if you, if you caught a sort of, um, if you put a matchbox into the solar wind and you, and you caught the particles, the density would be, I don't know, maybe 10 particles within your matchbox. Whereas if you were to do the same on the Earth, it would be 10 with 19 zeros after it. I don't even know what that is. Billion, 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 100 million, billion, billion particles in our atmosphere versus 10 in the same space in the solar wind. So it's really low density. Yet our telescopes are so good, we can pick up that moving material. And all the time, the sun is giving off this gusty wind and the Earth is sitting in it. And this is sort of brings in another area that I work on because I'm interested in how the Earth responds to sitting in this gusty outflow from the sun. And in fact, the Earth can respond pretty in a pretty extraordinary way. And probably the most beautiful way is by the creation of the aurora, the northern and southern lights. So very recently, maybe it was two, was it two days ago, for the people who keep an eye on sort of the solar activity and how the Earth's responding, there were some nice pictures from the International Space Station that were sent out looking down onto the Earth and seeing the aurora. And that's generated by this solar wind buffeting the Earth's magnetic field, setting up electric currents, and then lighting up the top of the atmosphere. But in fact, it can be worse than that because these electric currents can also flow through the ground, they can flow through our electricity networks, through our satellites, and they can cause real damage. So the Met Office now forecasts solar activity to be able to predict if there'll be an effect on our technology. So the, yeah, the Met Office opened up the Met Office Space Weather Operations Centre almost a year ago now looking at the sun all the time. So a lot of the work that I do is it's actually with the Met Office. I never thought I would say that. <laughs> so our sun is important to us from, on a day-to-day -day basis, but what drives us really is to understand the science of the sun. So let's have a bit of a look about where this solar wind actually comes from and why it might be variable, why it might vary over the solar cycle and why we might have fast streams and why we might have slow streams of solar wind. So this is the hot atmosphere glowing in ultraviolet light that we looked at at the start. And it's sitting above the visible surface that you can see with your telescopes. Now, I mentioned that the sun has a magnetic field and that this magnetic field flows out in the solar wind. And in fact, everything I do as a solar scientist is measuring and studying magnetic fields. So for any 